Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Robert Barr, and I'm delighted that you're joining with me and with others for this streaming Shabbat service. An opportunity for us to pause, to collect our thoughts, to, to catch our breath in this incredibly challenging and hectic times. So put away the pencil and the paper, put away the notebook and the keys, set aside the shovel and hammer. Rest for this interval, no buying, no selling, no working, no laboring, no straining, not living in the past, not planning for the future. This is a time for celebration, for joy, for mirth. We are here alive to rejoice in another Sabbath, another opportunity to be together, grateful for our family and our friends. With no distractions, we touch and are touched, the great gift of the Sabbath. Again, I'm Rabbi Robert Barr of Congregation Beth Adam. That's our bricks and mortar congregation here in greater Cincinnati and our Jewish community, our online congregation. We've been online for over a decade. We've been streaming services around the world for over a decade. We recognize that the internet allowed us to create relationships with people we may never meet in person. It allowed us to share what we were doing here in greater Cincinnati. It became a way for people to create community around the world. What's become even more important is in this time of the pandemic, when we are forced to socially distance, streaming services and being online has allowed us to create relationships that have become even more important than we could ever have imagined. It's wonderful that we can connect with one another, that we can know that we're part of something larger than ourselves, part of a community. But beyond the technology and the ability to create relationships which are profoundly important, it's, it's also the voice of Judaism that we give expression to here at Congregation Beth Adam that needs to be emphasized. We give voice to a bold, dynamic Judaism, a Judaism that is concerned less with our past and more with our future. We have been informed by science and modernity. We have information our ancestors never could have known. It should help reshape our Judaism, help us to rethink what is most important about what we give voice to. We recognize that we're not gonna be rescued by some divine hand is not gonna to save us for ourselves. We ultimately are responsibility for the future that we are creating. We give voice to that through our liturgy. That's why it is new and different. We give voice to it in the way we teach Jewish, edu Jewish education, our educational programming, the way we teach about the evolution of Judaism. So you're part of this community right now, whether you're watching it on one of our Facebook pages or our website. And if you like to chat, maybe you want to move over to our website, bethadam.org. You click on streaming Shabbat services, and there are a group of people there that like to chat, and you could be a part of that as well. We know that our services at six o'clock Eastern time don't always work for everybody. You may live in a different time zone. You may have to work on, on a Friday evening. So lots of people watch our services in our archives. Whenever you're watching, you are part of our community. Let us know where you're participating from. And please, whenever you make comments, please make them welcome, welcoming and inclusive. Now we continue our service with the lighting of the Shabbat candles. On this Shabbat, we create our moment in time. We pause to reflect upon our yesterdays and our tomorrows, to renew our ties with family and friends, to restore our energies, to refresh our spirits. As the sun descends and shadows lengthen, the distraction of the day gives way to the stillness of night. It is time now for us to, to see not with our eyes, but with our hearts and our minds. As the day gives way to evening, it is time to welcome the Sabbath. The candles stand before us waiting to be lit. We recall our ancestors as we too seek to dispel the darkness and banish the cold to, to bring glowing softness, warmth and safety into our homes. May the dancing flames of these candles kindle warmth within our hearts, wisdom in our mind, passion in our souls. Baruch or ba'olam, blessed is the light within the world. Baruch or ba'adam, blessed is the light within each person. Baruch or ba'shabbat, blessed is the light of the Sabbath. Several days ago, 
I had the opportunity to have a conversation with one of my literally oldest friends, person I've known probably longer than other than my brothers, perhaps more than anyone else I've known. And he, Dr. Fred Pinckney, is going to talk to us about issues about pollutants, cleaning up rivers in Washington, D.C., and the work that he is doing. Fred is a senior biologist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department, and he's doing some very interesting and very important work. I hope you find our conversation as interesting and as fun as I had participating in it. I am so excited to be welcoming Dr. Fred Pinckney uh, to this Friday night service. I have a confession to make. I knew Dr. Pinckney long before he was Dr. Pinckney when he called me Bobby and I called him <laughs> Freddie and we grew up together. We went to elementary school together. Uh, I have a picture of you at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> I was able to officiate at your wedding. So we have a long a long history, and it's so exciting for you to be joining us tonight, but we're not here to reminisce about our past. We're here to talk about your expertise as an environmental scientist uh, with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department of uh, the U.S. government and the work that you've been doing, a lot of which has revolves around issues of pollutants and contaminants in our waterways, our watershed, Chesapeake Bay. And I'm want you to share your experiences with us and what we as lay people need to be thinking about. But first, how are you doing? Your wife, your family, everyone's healthy? <laughs> everyone's good. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I have the freedom both to work at home and to get outdoors fairly frequently uh, to sample, including actually getting paid to go out in canoes and kayaks to catch fish. So, because your your expertise, you you work with fish. I mean, that's a big area where mainly, you study mainly, mainly fish. Um, so, really, the focus of my work has been on how chemicals affect fish. And there's almost like two different sides to that. It's chemicals that build up in fish that can harm the people that eat the fish, and then what are the chemicals doing to the fish themselves? So I got to ask the question, how did you get into fish? I mean, I don't, I don't remember you being yeah. a, did you no, have a fish tank growing up? I can't remember. Not, not really. It's actually sort of interesting in grade 6B. <laughs> Six, that's right, that grade, six grade, um, they had an assignment to do a copper, copper enamel where you sort of etch into copper. And for some reason, I saved this and it was a picture of a fish in the habitat with like grasses in the water. And at that time I had no conscious idea that that was going to be my future, but mm -hmm. it was there somehow deep down. That's interesting. And, yeah. and what you, I get, what you understand is by examining, understanding fish, you're understanding how these pollutants are getting into the water and changing changing both the fish and then impacting us as human beings? Right. And it, then it, you know, in many ways, it becomes a detective story. And I have to say, I like some of the forensic shows on TV. And so, you know, just to give you a quick example, I'm involved a lot in the Anacostia River, which is a pretty contaminated river in Washington, D.C. They used to call it the uh, Forgotten River, Anaconda. Yeah, because where is it in D.C.? I mean, I think... It, it, it's right by um, the new National Stadium. It's about a mile from the Capitol. Really? And it goes through poor neighborhoods of Washington. So you talk of east of the river are the two poorest wards, Ward 7 and Ward 8. And these are food deserts and, um, you know, much lower standard of living than the more wealthier wards on the west side of the river. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where you find people eating contaminated fish because that's a source of protein. Mm -hmm. So people are fishing in the river to get that, their Right, and despite the health advisories that say, don't eat any carp or only eat one meal a month, there are people that go out there pretty regularly and they eat not just themselves, but they feed their families 
with contaminated fish. And where's the contaminants coming from? Um, so there are some small waste sites on the Anacostia. There's a former power plant that uh, used to recycle transformers, which have polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, which cause cancer in people and build up in the tissue of the fish. So that, you know, a fish that's high on the food chain or a bottom feeder like a catfish can have quite high concentrations, making it unsafe for people to eat. Hmm. And so you've been, so you, you study that and you're working to try to clean up the river or what? What's right. The so right now, the District of Columbia government has a huge project called the Anacostia River Sediment Project. And you can Google that. And they're trying to clean up not just the contaminated sediments, because these chemicals come in the water, but they don't like being dissolved. So they tend to uh, sink to the bottom and then bottom dwelling fish like catfish um, feed near the bottom and either eat some of the mud directly or eat the animals that are living in the mud. So that builds up in people, but the detective part comes in because there's a huge emphasis on cleaning up the sediments, but me and some colleagues says, well, what about the stuff that's still coming in? And so we did a study on five tributaries and we found that one tributary called Lower Beaver Dam Creek, which only has like 15% of the flow into the Anacostia has three quarters of the PCBs. Hmm. And so now there's the state and other people are doing track town studies to try to figure out, is it a recycling plant? Is it some kind of hazardous waste site? And we can use fish that don't move very far as tools to fingerprint where it's coming from. Wow. So, and I, gotta, I have to assume that this river flows into something, into another body of water. It doesn't, so it what- goes into the, Goes into the Potomac and eventually to Chesapeake Bay. So, so does so does so does the the, the chemicals that you're tracking are then are polluting the Potomac as well as Chesapeake Bay too. To some those extent. fish move around; they don't just live; they don't just right. stay where they are. They don't go. Hey, actually, the fish movement is sort of like the secret sauce, and, and I don't like that expression. But <laughs> in part of my studies, I have given slides to say a fish for every reason because I use one fish which develops cancer. So that's my cancer monitoring tool. Mm -hmm. And another fish has a very small home range, like only half a mile or less. So that's my detective pinpointing where the pollutants are coming from. And so it's complicated and you can't just pick one fish and say, this is representative of everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I don't know how to say this exactly, but why should the general public be worried about these things? What, what's the, what sort of the bigger implications of why well, we should be yeah. cognizant? I mean, what I, yeah, what I mentioned before is poor people um, eating contaminated fish. That's number one. Right. And then eventually it would be not, there are certain cities or places like Boston and some places in Europe that, have cleaned up the water to the extent that people are swimming in urban rivers on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole other effort to try to figure out where the E. coli and um, bacterial contamination is from, coming mm -hmm. from. But I really believe that cities can be compatible with very clean environments if people are willing to put out the effort and time. So it's a matter of environmental justice and it's a matter of just standard of living. People treasure having good water near them. And there's a huge explosion of people who are rowing on the rivers and enjoying the nature that is coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a problem that's been building up for a long time. It's is been it building up for a long time and um, in many ways, things have gotten better. Some of these old chemicals are no, have been banned and are very slowly decreasing in the contaminant levels in the water and in the fish, but not always, not quickly. And so you need to do good science to try to figure out 
you know, where are the remnants of it and where's the current stuff coming from? So I, I, it feels like in America right now, the issue of good science and data is oftentimes um, under siege. As somebody who works for the U.S. government, how, how are you feeling as a scientist? Um, so I have consciously stayed at a technical level and... You know, I've been to retirement parties where people say, you know, my best years were was when I was a field biologist and I was outside two or three or four times a week. And I thought, I think there's a lesson there. I sh that's what I enjoy. And so I supervised for a year and I didn't like it. And they let me advertise for a new supervisor. So the politics affects me on a budget type level but I have never had any problems to date with somebody censoring my science. Through science, and you've done, I mean, I know, I know I've seen pictures of you out in, the, in, the, in Chesapeake Bay. I know you took my son out collecting birds, I think, on Poplar it's Island. Different. Yes, yeah. You're collecting birds. I can't remember what it was, but I remember you walking yeah. around. Simi said, yeah, I was out there with Brad. We were grabbing <laughs> stuff. So you really mean you're, a, you, you, you like getting into the, to the muck in the water and, and really doing the hard science and sort of discovering what is, is happening. I mean, you've been doing it. You, you write about, I know, intersex fish, I think. Right. I mean, right. Fish with that. You talk about that. That was like, I remember that you, you, yeah, that's a, yeah. And what I also like is, so my actual expertise is called aquatic toxicology. And it's a very nice mixture of big and small. So like for the fish tumors, I collect the fish and I have a collaborator who's a world renowned fish pathologist and he reads the slides and he says, gee, you've got 42 out of 112 have liver tumors. And then I have a very good statistician who, who can work with the data and say, well, that might be a little bit off because you have mostly females and, and you don't have as many males and females get more liver tumors. Then I go back to the pathologist and I say, why do females have more liver tumors than males? And he gives me an answer. So mm -hmm. the field that I'm in is unique, I think, in that you get to look from the microscopic or submicroscopic to the organism. Mm -hmm. And so I'm both in the lab, more or less mildly, and in the field a decent amount. So could you talk just a second about intersex fish? Because I remember that you actually got, I think they refer, re referenced your paper in the New York Times, I recall. So um, there are certain kinds of, of bass, smallmouth bass especially, that uh, the um, males start producing vitelligenin, which is a protein used in the formation of fish eggs. And so they are triggered by being exposed to hormones or other chemicals in the environment. And the mechanisms are really still under study. We know that if you put fish close to a wastewater treatment plant, a lot of these chemicals will go right through and then start um, this type of uh, sequence of um, wow. functional changes in the fish. But the study that that you remember is we did some work in the Potomac and a colleague and I drove to Cincinnati to get um, fish from a hatchery because we thought, well, surely hatchery fish are not gonna have any intersects. So that was our control. And it turned out that particular hatchery bought the fish from somewhere in Kansas that may have been left next to a cattle feedlot and we had as much intersects in the controls as we did in the wild fish from the environment. Wow. So there's been a lot of work relating this intersects to confined or intensive animal agriculture. Which is really, I mean, that's, which is also really a, a serious issue is you know, right. the agribusness and the, the runoff and how it's changing or polluting the environment. Right. And then the implications right. of it and, 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 how it then comes into our all of our lives. I mean, the issue of social right. justice and, and the environment is important for people in poor neighborhoods who often were forced to live near uh, sort of industrial plants, but it also is affecting people who aren't necessarily living there because it's it, it, water flows where it flows, right? It just goes right. where it goes. 
Right. One of the things that started, I guess, maybe 10 years ago, it's a very small program, but it has a lot of vision to it. It's called the Urban Waters Federal Partnership. And the twin goals of that are to, there's 20 or so cities across the country, Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Um, I don't think Cincinnati is one, but, and the goal is to get a bunch of agencies that never talk to each other together and to do projects that will both help clean the water, but also help the economic situation in these disadvantaged areas. Wow. So for the one for the Anacostia, I worked with a team that started a three acre urban farm on a vacant lot that used to be a housing tower that was torn down and had sat empty for 20 years. And we were able to leverage money, not just from the agencies, but we got the DC Building Industry Association with the big contractors to put in about a half a million dollars and built this beautiful three acre farm that has plots for the local residents to grow their own food and education about food insecurity and, and nutrition. That's great. I mean, this is really, I mean, what, what I like about what you're, the work you're doing is the, the intersection between the science, the cleaning up the, the pollutants and the social justice piece that are, they're all, in, they're, they're intertwined, that they're, they're not separate sort of silos right. that you, that you're, the work you're doing. And I know in your own backyard, you grow, uh, <laughs> I remember you were, were you plowing up part of your backyard to put more, uh, yes. Garden. There's, there's no grass in my backyard. I've got about a dozen or so raised beds. And so I, I have to ask because I remember you wanted to. See, you were you were interested in the biblical uh, references to wheat, and you were trying. You grew wheat <laughs> to, to to see. Right. I can't remember why. I just remember you. you grew well, we, so here's another commercial. We have a a garden at our synagogue, um, Adat Shalom in Bethesda, and it's called the Mishnah Garden. And the twin goals are to educate each other, including children, on where food comes from and, and how to grow food. And one year we did, we planted winter wheat and we harvested in uh, June. And uh, we made a loaf of bread that the rabbi served on the bima. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, yeah. I, I, I just, I, I, I remember you did some hydroponics. So we actually have at, at Beth Adama, I just want to share this with you and with oh. people. We have a hydroponic tower now growing. Oh, cool. and, and so, and it, what, what's amazing, it's, I, I, I don't know what the, its roots are in, what the, the, the plants it's are in. A, it's water with some, some nutrients <laughs> and metal, trace metals in it. And it, what, what's amazing, so we're growing like arugula and, and lettuce and things like that and how quickly it grew. And, and actually, I have to say what was so amazing and so powerful was uh, the kids harvested it. And they mm -hmm. brought it up to the adults who were in the soup getting ready to prepare the food for the soup kitchen. And they uh -huh. presented the, the greens. Well, to, yeah. and, and so there was this interaction about where does food come from? Why are some people uh, disadvantaged with food? And how could we make a difference? And and talking about the, talking about it. So I think it's great that your synagogue's doing it. And I, the work that you're doing is is so interesting. It's I mean I find it fascinating. How I, I like the detective piece of it because I think we yeah. oftentimes don't appreciate the implications of what science is really teaching us and how it really does make a difference. Right. No. Thank you. I mean. So what's all, you know, sometimes, you know, you write a paper and it lies on the shelf and three people cite it. And so when I, you know, I'm starting to get up in age as, as you might be too. <laughs> no, no. What is it? I Fred, you're, you're like, like so much older than me. <laughs> and so you want to look back and see concrete things that you contributed right. to. And I think that's the other reason why I stayed away from management. Although I do really like mentoring. Yeah, no, you've been, that's, that's great. And I, so I'm so pleased that I just, before we end, I do have this vague memory of you and I skipping school one day uh -oh. and going down, I think we went to, to the, 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 the historical museum in, in uh, downtown Detroit. And I think we walked, walked across the street and saw your mom at the library. Uh oh, <laughs> 
I don't know why that memory came back to me, but I, but it did come come back to me. That's so great. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate the work you're doing. I appreciate Thank that you're you. helping make sure that we're safer and that people who are disadvantaged can can have resources and eat the food that should be plentiful and, and safe to eat. I think this right. is important stuff. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for being. And yeah, I, no, I really enjoyed it, Robert. This is, this is and I, because of you, I'm cited in a government paper. You, you put me in that acknowledgement. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I read that. I was so proud. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this was great. Okay. I enjoyed it a lot. I, I really enjoyed that conversation with Fred not only because our friendship stretches back all the way to elementary school, but also because of the kind of work that he has devoted his life to, making sure that our environment is safer and healthier for all people. It is an issue both of science and of social justice, and he is deeply committed to the work that he is doing and each of us should be inspired by it and think about how we can contribute to making our environment healthier and safer for everyone. Now we're gonna continue our service with our virtual holla. Uh, and we do this as a, an affirmation that we are part of a community. And at some point, again, we will be sitting together at one table, enjoying holla and wine and a meal. So as the fingers of the holla intertwine, so do we join hands in our common humanity, sharing the fruits of our labors we cherish that which has been created through human effort. For through the work of our hands, the strength of the human spirit, the vision of our minds that our dreams are woven into the tapestry of time. We celebrate the accomplishments of yesterday and today, anticipating the possibilities of tomorrow. May the sharing of the Chala strengthen our bond with others who walk upon this earth. Baruch HaMau Kapenu, blessed is the work of our hands. Baruch HaZon HaAdam, blessed is the vision of our minds. Blessed is the bread of the earth. And then if you have some juice or some wine, join with me. We celebrate the fruit of the vine and the bounty of nature as we lift the cup. For we are part of nature, which gave us birth and continues to sustain us. Even as we depend upon nature, so do we influence its course. Through the search for understanding, we've gained the knowledge to shape our world. Guided by the best of human wisdom, the compassion of our spirit, we accept the responsibility which rests upon us. May the taste of the wine or juice upon our lips stir within us a reverence for nature and a respect for human endeavor. Ruchim hachayim ba'olam, blessed is the life within the world. Ruchim hachayim ba'adam, blessed is the life within each person. And so we say l'chaim, to life. So I'm delighted that you were able to share this Shabbat service with me, with Fred, and with each other. And I hope you'll join uh, next week. Next week is Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, that Friday is a Friday after Thanksgiving here in the United States. And I hope you can join with me. I'll be reading a Midrash next week, a uh, Jewish legend, a Jewish tale. Uh, and But we'll be together and we can chat. So you can also always go to bethadam.org. There you can find our upcoming events, what uh, services we're having, educational programs. You can listen to my podcast. And already we have posted their uh, resource page for Hanukkah. So if you have children or grandchildren, nieces or nephews or, or kids you know and you wanna interact with them and take some of the tier materials that we've created about Hanukkah, go there and enjoy. And we close our service with the words we close our services with each week. May we know blessings those who are near. May we know blessings those who are far. May the Sabbath bring its goodness to everyone soon, wherever they are. Shabbat Shalom.